let's begin and talk about, or not begin, but let's continue on with our chapter four, which is the cell. And when we left off, we were talking about this guy, diffusion, the movement of solutes, a passive process. All right, if we go down to we're wrong way here, this is what we were going to be talking about today. And then many other things, a lot of stuff to talk about for membrane transport. We are gonna learn about how we get things in and out of the cell across the plasma membrane. We're starting off with passive processes. I started to move into diffusion. And we talked about how it's the movement of solutes uh, um, from an area of high concentration to an area of low concentration. And so that will be influenced by a couple of things. One, the temperature of whatever uh, we are moving things across. So if we increase the temperature of the environment, we'll increase the movement of those particles and the steepness of the concentration gradient. If there's a large difference across the plasma membrane, things move quicker. And then as that steepness declines, becomes less and less, that difference, then things start to slow down. So simple diffusion, real, no pun intended, real simple, okay? Simple diffusion all right, is going to involve the movement of solutes. The qualities that we're looking in these solutes are gonna be small and nonpolar. And basically they're gonna pass right in between those phospholipid molecules in our plasma membrane because they're small and nonpolar. So oxygen, carbon dioxide, you're gonna see some fatty acids now granted, um, usually the smaller chain fatty acids will be much easier, All right? Alcohol, ethanol, urea, which is gonna be a waste product, no problem, all right? So these things are not going to be regulated, important fact to know, by the plasma membrane. So like I said before, the movement is going to depend on the concentration gradient. One, if, if it exists, all right? And two, how steep it is. All right, and as long as the concentration gradient exists, movement will occur. But again, we're always looking for balance, equilibrium, that sort of thing. So once we reach equilibrium, there's not gonna be any more movement occurring here. So here's that nice, beautiful picture of our respiratory gases inside and outside the cell, right? You can see here, the red represents the oxygen. We have a lot of oxygen molecules outside the cell, interstitial fluid. Interstitial fluid is the fluid outside of our cells. Cytosol is the intracellular fluid inside the cell. So you can see there's a lot out here, very few in here. So they move across the plasma membrane right in between the phospholipid molecules into the inside of the cell. Same goes for carbon dioxide, okay? Carbon dioxide is a waste product, all right, of, resp uh, of respiration, okay? So we're gonna see the cell starts to do these uh, metabolic processes. One of the byproducts and waste products is carbon dioxide, starts to build up on the inside of the cell. So it moves from an area of high concentration in the cytosol to an area of low concentration in the interstitial fluid and it moves across the plasma membrane. That's simple. Moving down, there are concentration gradients, right? That, and diffusion is going to be the movement of solutes. We're not talking about water and those solutes need to be small and nonpolar. All right, so that is the first type of diffusion. Right, simple diffusion. The other type of diffusion is facilitated diffusion. And that means that this type of diffusion requires assistance, needs help. So guess who's gonna help? Our plasma membrane proteins, All right? Those proteins are gonna assist in the movement of things across the plasma membrane. And some of those qualities will, will be, yes, they're gonna be small, but they could be charged like ions, like sodium, potassium, or they can be polar solutes. So charged or polar solutes need help. And so to the rescue comes the plasma membrane proteins, and they're gonna help out here. So there's two types, channel mediated diffusion, which we'll talk a lot about later on in chapters um, 12 and 10. All right, we'll talk about it some here. And then carrier mediated diffusion. So channel mediated diffusion is going to involve a channel, which is gonna be a protein, and it's gonna have this tunnel or this passageway that goes through the middle of it, and it's gonna be filled with water, 
right? But it allows the movement of small ions, okay? So what are small ions? All righty, small ions are charged particles. They can be cations or anions, right? So it's only going to allow one type of ion. It's specific. So when we name these channels, for example, a voltage-gated sodium ion channel, all right, that means that only sodium can move through this channel. Voltage-gated potassium channels, again, only allow the movement of potassium through those channels. So there's two types of channels that we're going to discuss today. We have our leak channels. They're like 7-Eleven, all right? They are open 24 seven, they never close, open, open, open. The other type is the gated channel, right? And gated channels, like the name implies, are gated. There's a gate there. Like if you have a gate to your fence in your backyard, all right, obviously people can get in if the gate is open. If the gate is closed, nothing can get in. Same thing here. These gates are usually closed and they'll open in response to a certain type of stimulus. And when they do open, they're only open for a very brief moment of time. So again, when we get into chapters 10 and 12, we'll learn about that, especially when we're talking about our muscle and nerve cells. But for right now, just know that the, what these two types of channels are, right, and how they present. Are they always open? Are they usually closed? That sort of thing. The other type, all right, of, of diffusion is the carrier mediated diffusion. Very similar, again, we're gonna be dealing with small and polar molecules and they'll need help crossing that plasma membrane. But now this type of plasma membrane protein is what we call a carrier protein. And it's important because once whatever it is that we're trying to get across the plasma membrane, it's gonna bind onto this protein. And when it does that, it changes the shape of the plasma membrane protein or the carrier protein. And by doing that, all right, it allows the movement of whatever that substance is from outside the cell to inside the cell, okay? So it will change that, the shape of that actual protein to allow that movement. And again, these types of solutes always move down their concentration gradient. So if we're only gonna be dealing with one type of substance, we call that a uniporter. Uni meaning one, right? Glucose is a perfect example. In fact, this is a good concept to understand because what will happen is if we need more of this uh, solute to move into the cell, for example, the cell will make more carrier mediated proteins and stick them in the plasma membrane. But eventually it reaches the maximum number. There's just no more room, okay? We can't fit any more of these proteins in the plasma membrane. So when we talk about the number of channels and the carriers, right, we can actually reach a limit. But up to that point, we can increase the number of those channels and or carrier proteins, and that will increase the rate of the movement of that substance when we're transporting it across the plasma membrane. But there is a max, and we see that when we talk about the glucose transporters, because eventually cells just can't fit any more, all right, when they're trying to decrease, all right, your blood sugar levels, all right, and you'll see it in diabetics, and then that's when they'll start to um, show urine, excuse me, they'll show sugar or glucose in their urine. So here you can see our nice carrier-mediated uh, transport going on here. And you can see we have glucose outside of our cell, all right? And as the glucose binds on to the carrier mediated uh, protein, it starts to change shape. It's kind of a wedge shape here facing out. Then it closes both ends and then it turns into a wedge shaped structure facing in. And that's what we're talking about. So as that molecule moves across the protein, it will change shape. Okay. So that's it for diffusion. We're still talking about passive processes here. So I want to talk about this other type of passive process, which is called osmosis. Osmosis is a very important concept to understand because it involves water. 
does not involve solutes. So when you hear osmosis, you're going to think a couple of things. One, you're going to think about we're only dealing with the movement of water and nothing else. Don't be fooled, right? If you get a test question and it's talking about glucose or sodium, and one of the answer choices is osmosis, all right, you really shouldn't be considering that because it's not involving the movement of water. Make sure you read the, the question carefully though, right? But if it's talking about the movement of a solute, we're not talking about osmosis here. So please make sure that you understand that. Next is when we talk about the movement of water, it's got to move through what we call, and this is important, a selectively permeable membrane, which means that this membrane only allows for the movement of water and nothing else, right? So we call it selectively permeable. And so this is this type of concept, this process here, is going to show us that there's going to be a, a difference in the amount of water that we're going to see inside the cell and or outside the cell. And so we're going to talk about that. All right, so keep in mind, passive process, no energy is utilized. It's only going to involve the movement of water. So water can cross the plasma membrane by two uh, methods. All right, one, it can slide right in between the phospholipid bilayer, like we saw before with oxygen or carbon dioxide, or it can go through an aquaporin, which is a water channel, okay? So again, it's a transport protein, all right? It's an integral transport protein because it spans the entire thickness of the plasma membrane. So we call it an aquaporin. All right. So that is how water moves across. Now we need to discuss, all right, solutes because solutes are going to influence the movement of water. And I'm gonna talk about this here in a moment, but before I do, I wanna talk about the two types of solutes. We have permeable solutes and non-permeable solutes, all right? Permeable pass through the bilayer. So you should already know then, all right, two of the qualities, they're listed here, but you should already know when we have things passing right through that phospholipid bilayer, that two of the qualities of those solutes, they need to be small and nonpolar. Small and nonpolar. Those are gonna be our permeable solutes. We saw that with water, carbon dioxide, urea, all right, ethanol, some of our fatty acids. I mentioned some of those earlier. The non-permeable are gonna be the ones that can't pass through the bilayer, okay? And so we know that they're gonna either be large, right? Or charged or polar, right? So we talked about our ions, sodium, potassium, no problem. We've got special channels that allow for the movement of those. Glucose, remember that carrier mediated diffusion, right? Okay, and proteins, right? So that's what we're talking about. Those are some of the examples of some of the solutes all right, that are non-permeable solutes. They cannot get through the lipid bilayer. All right, so when we're talking about the, the concentration of solutes across our plasma membrane, reminder, we're discussing the difference all right, between the cytosol, the intracellular fluid, and the interstitial fluid, which is outside the cell, or the extracellular fluid, same thing. So if we have a concentration gradient that exists, remember, if there wasn't any concentration gradient, we're not gonna have any movement. So if we have a concentration gradient existing, that is going to cause the movement of water. And this is an important concept right here. Concentration, or excuse me, greater concentration of solutes contain a lower concentration of water need to put that into your brain right now, okay? So the greater concentration of solutes is going to contain a lower concentration of water. That concept needs to be memorized and put into your brains, okay? So what do we always say, right? When we're talking about these passive processes, these passive processes involve the movement of something down its concentration gradient. All right, so that means that water is gonna go from an area of high water concentration to an area of low water concentration. Well, this statement here says, the greater concentration of solutes contains a lower concentration of water. 
So another way that I could say this, all right, when we're talking about the movement of water with osmosis is water is gonna move from an area of high water concentration to an area of low water concentration. So I could just scratch out, well, I shouldn't scratch that out. I could also say that water moves from an area of high water concentration to an area of high concentration of solutes. Because remember, the area that has a greater concentration of solutes has a lower concentration of water. And water wants to move from an area of high water concentration to an area of low water concentration. It's going to move down its gradient until equilibrium is reached. So the example here says, Water moves from a solution of 1% solutes, which has a wa higher water concentration, into a solution containing 33, excuse me, 3% solutes, lower water concentration. All right, I need somewhere to draw. All right, so let me quickly explain that to you. So here we have, Oh, wait, 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 where's my brain? Okay, so here we have 1% of solutes. So let's go base it off of 100 percentile. Um, all right, 1% of solutes. On one side, well, hold on one second. And then on the other side, 3% solutes. Which means on this side, we have 99% water, H2O. And then over here, we have 97%. Water. Okay, so I want you to look at what I'm kind of uh, stop it. All right. I want you to look at kind of what I'm getting at here. So here's our semi permeable membrane right here in between. We have our two little compartments here. Okay, so in compartment A, we have 1% of that whole compartment is made up of solutes. This is all out of 100. It's all out of 100. Okay, so 100 on both sides. My math is correct to help. All right, so in compartment A, 1% of the overall percentage of whatever's in there is solutes. The other 99% is water. Then in compartment B, we have 3% solutes. And then the other remaining percentage is going to be 97% water. If you add those numbers up in blue, they should both equal 100. You see what I'm saying? All right, I'm going to wait because I, I need you folks to understand. Are we cool on that? Do we understand right now? At least a little bit of what I'm trying to work towards. Okay, okay. Let's agree on just the math. This is just simple math. All right, so look at these numbers. Which side? has a greater water concentration, compartment A or compartment B. Don't, don't be fooled, the numbers are sitting there. Exactly, exactly, David. Compartment A, yes, yes, perfect. All right, so now, knowing what I just taught you, we're talking about osmosis. Osmosis is gonna go from an area of high water concentration to an area of low water concentration. So which direction does water want to move? Does it want to move from compartment A into B or from B into A? All right, I see one, exactly. Anybody else? Yeah, good, good. I love it, okay, good, okay. So we can agree on that. So look, we see that water is gonna move from A to B, just like that. So look, where is water going? It's going from an area of low solute concentration to an area of 
higher solute concentration. Do you kind of see where I'm going with that? I hope so. Okay, good. All right. I'm trying. This concept can sometimes throw people off. You folks are amazing. All right. Then I'm doing a better job explaining it. Okay. So again, you're going to see that area is going to move from an area of high water concentration to an area of low concentration. But because of that, it's going to move from an area where there's a lower solute concentration to an area of higher solute concentration. Now, this picture here is showing us, all right, just the movement uh, um, options that water has. It can move through the plasma membrane like it's doing right here, or it can move through our aquaporins. All right, so it has options. It has options. Okay, good, good. You folks are kicking butt. All right, let's move on to the next slide. Okay, so that brings up another concept that involves osmosis or the movement of water. So when water is moving, it's going to create pressure. All right, so as it's moving through that semi-permeable membrane, it's going to exert some sort of pressure. And that is going to be due to that difference that we talked about just in that previous slide of solution concentration. All right, so the greater the gradient, the difference in the solute concentration, all right, the more water will move. And when water moves, it's just like when you turn your faucet on. Okay, you open that faucet wide open, it's going to pour out of there. There's going to be more pressure, it, all right? And that's going to have, that deals with pressure gradients and whatnot, all right? But it's going to be similar to that concept, all right, when water is starting to move. So the steeper the gradient, the greater the osmotic pressure. This term right here is greatly, greatly um, influential when we're talking about the movement of items in and out of our capillaries, it's called hydrostatic pressure. I'm gonna read the definition here. Pressure exerted by a fluid on the inside of its container. The example here is blood in the capillary wall. Okay, so here is your capillary wall. Okay, and blood moves through it just like that. Well, when it's moving through that pipe, like water does, all right, or blood, it pushes on the wall of whatever it's in. Blood does this, the water in your hose, the water in the pipes of your house. So we give that name of that pressure, all right, the, 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 whatever that fluid is, that's pushing on those walls, we call it hydrostatic pressure. So you'll have a certain amount of hydrostatic pressure in your veins, your capillaries, your arteries, right? We talk a lot about it mostly in the capillaries because you're trying to get things to leave the capillaries. And at the same time, you're trying to get things to move into the capillaries, right? When we're talking about absorption and filtration and all that, all right? So hydrostatic pressure, that's the pressure of a fluid that's inside of a container, all right? that is pressing on the walls of the inside of whatever that container is, tube, whatever you have, okay? Hydrostatic pressure. So you can see here on our picture here, when we're talking about osmotic pressure, you'll notice here on the left side of our screen, right, the water molecules are the red molecules with the blue dots on it. The black dots are just the uh, solutes. And if you can see side A compared to side B has more black solutes here. Side B has four, side A has seven, eight, okay? So right now they have the equal number of water on each side. Now we have our semi-permeable membrane. Now we let na nature take over. And where does water wanna go? To an area of less water concentration or to an area that has more solutes. So you'll see that water will go from side B into side A. 
it's going to go to where there's a greater solute concentration. So you'll have more pressure as it moves through. That leads me into tonicity. So now we're gonna talk about what osmosis and the water pressure with the movement of osmosis, what that does to cells, okay? Because when we talk about tonicity, we're gonna to be talking about the changes in our, our osmotic pressure. So basically cells are either gonna gain or lose water, all right, with osmosis. And because of that gain or loss of water, it's gonna change the size of the cell. And it also is gonna change the osmotic pressure, the pressure inside the cell or outside the cell. So we give a term to this, all right? We talk about tonicity. And so we're gonna be focusing on the ability of a solution to change the volume or the pressure, which is also known as the tone when we're talking about cells, okay? The pressure or tone of a cell by osmosis. So we're gonna take a cell and we're gonna put it in a solution. And we talk about the tonicity of the solution, all right? We're gonna see what that solution does to the cell. And so there's three things that we're gonna talk about when we're dealing with the solutions. We can have an isotonic solution, a hypotonic solution, or a hypertonic solution. So let me run through all those, all right? Iso means the same. It's not gonna change. So when we talk about an isotonic solution, this means, all right, that both the cytosol and the solution have the same exact concentration of solutes. The same. <clears throat> so that means if you have 10 solutes inside the cell and 10 solutes outside the cell, all right, water wants to go to the area that has less solutes. Well, guess what? There isn't, there's no concentration gradient for the solutes. So that means there's no net movement of water. That's why normal saline is a wonderful product to give to people that have decreased blood volume. If they're hemorrhaging, okay, normal saline helps to increase the blood volume, which helps to increase the blood pressure. So this is what we give to folks, you know, that are on an IV drip if their blood pressure has decreased. If we're already treating them with obvious, you know, certain medications and other means. Okay, but say they've lost quite a bit of blood, okay? Obviously we'll give them blood, all right? But in certain situations, sometimes we've got to get their blood volume up to get that blood pressure up. So this means when we're dealing with blood cells, erythrocytes, isotonic to erythrocytes means there's no movement of water in and out of the erythrocyte. So the cells are left alone. The next type of solution is a hypotonic solution. That means the solution has fewer solutes inside of it compared to the solute concentration in the cytosol. So for example, pure water, all right? So when we take a red blood cell and put it into pure water, all right, the solution outside of the cell has less, uh, uh, less solutes compared to the solutes inside the cell. Well, what does water want to do? It always wants to move to the area of higher concentration of solutes. So that move means that water is going to go from outside the cell to inside the cell. And therefore, it'll increase the volume of the cell and the pressure inside the cell and the, if it keeps moving like that, we could literally pop, all right, or rupture the red blood cells. We call that lysis. When we're talking about um, erythrocytes, all right, we call that hemolysis. Those red blood cells will start to burst because the osmotic pressure inside is increased significantly because water wants to move from an area of low solute concentration to an area of high solute concentration which is the same as saying it wants to go from an area of high water concentration to an area of low water concentration. The last, the last type of solution is the hypertonic solution. 
All right, so now we're gonna take our red blood cell and we're gonna drop it into a solution that has a higher concentration of solutes than the cytosol has. All right, so again, where does water wanna go? It wants to leave the cell and go outside the cell. So we'll see this when we take a red blood cell and put it into 3% right, sodium chloride solution. And so as water moves down its concentration gradient, right, it's going to go to where the greater concentration of solutes is going to be, and that is going to be the outside of the cell. So this will cause the cell to decrease both pressure and volume, and the cell shrinks. We call that crenation. Crenation. This picture here shows all that. So the isotonic solution here that we've taken our red blood cell has the same number of solutes outside the cell as inside the cell. So water doesn't move. Now we drop it into a solution that's hypotonic. It has a decrease or a lower concentration of solutes outside the cell compared to inside the cell. So the water in the solution is going to move into the cell causing the cell to swell up and eventually possibly burst. And then finally, we take our red blood cell and drop it into a hypertonic solution. Okay, that means the solution outside the cell, all right, has more solutes than inside. So water wants to go that higher concentration gradient of solutes and it leaves the inside of the cell, goes out and the cell shrinks. All right. So what occurs to the tonicity of a cell when placed in a hypertonic solution? Nothing. Does it lyse or does it crenate? Or you can use whatever term you want. Go ahead and type your answers in. All right, we have a hypertonic solution. We drop our cell into it. Hypertonic solution means it has a large concentration gradient of solutes in that solution. What happens to that cell? Nothing. Does it lice or burst or does it shrink or crenate? Only one person? That's right, Christina, you got it. It crenates, it shrinks. Good, 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 good. All right. Awesome. Okay, let's. Um, move water leaves a cell, decrease in volume and pressure. All right, let's leave our passive processes now. And we're going to move into our active processes. So when we talk about our active processes, a couple characteristics, well, what are the active processes? Active processes are going to involve active transport, which means it's going to involve energy, right? But also, that involves vesicular transport. Those little bubbles that are made inside the cells that are gonna be transporting things, right, is considered part of active transport. So aside from the fact that active transport requires an energy, we also are going to see that we are gonna move a solute. Again, it's a solute, we're not dealing with water now, okay? That's osmosis. So we're gonna move a solute against its concentration gradient or up its concentration gradient. You remember what I said last time? It's like rolling a rock up a hill, it takes a lot of energy. Roll that big old boulder up the hill, that's gonna require energy. Well, that's what we're doing here. We're trying to do our, our active transport, we're pushing our rock against its concentration gradient up that hill, so it's gonna take some energy. Okay. So this is going to help to maintain, all right, a lot of times when we're trying to generate a concentration gradient, active transport is how we can do it. And so it will actually create a gradient between the inside of the cell, all right, the cytosol, and the outside of the cell, and the interstitial fluid. All right, so let's talk about a couple of these active transport processes. Ion pumps. We're going to be talking about this a lot, so it's really important that you understand these structures, all right? Again, ion pumps are transport proteins. 
And so their job is going to move ions across the cell membrane. Also keep in mind against their concentration gradient. So this helps to create a certain type of concentration gradient of ions inside the cell. All right, and we'll get into that because leak channels and pumps and, and channel uh, um, and um, facilitated channels and whatnot, we'll get into that. But understand that these ion pumps will help to maintain a gradient, but especially when we're dealing with the internal concentration of certain ions inside the cell. One of the examples we'll see here are the calcium pumps that we'll see in our red blood cells. If it wasn't for these pumps, red blood cells, think about, well, the red blood cells plasma membranes would become more rigid. That's a problem because red blood cells need to be able to move through really tight spaces. And so their plasma membrane has to be nice and fluid. It needs to be able to kind of uh, uh, squeeze in between things. All right, so if the plasma membrane was rigid, all right, then that could, that could cause the plasma membrane to become damaged and then the cell could end up dying. So these pumps, all right, pump calcium outside of the cell because if calcium starts to build up inside the cell, it will add and it'll accumulate and it will add to the rigidity of the cell. That's not a good thing. The other type of plasma membrane pump that we're gonna look at, we're gonna see this in a lot of detail is the sodium potassium ion pump. And these pumps, right, their basic job is to move sodium out of the cell right here and to move potassium into the cell. So for every three sodium that this pump, uh, for every three sodium, this pump will pump it excuse me, for every three sodium this pump pumps out of the cell, it's gonna pump in two potassium into the cell. And that is going to cost just one ATP molecule. So that's what this picture here is showing you. I'll go into much more detail in chapter 12, so I really can kind of gloss over this. All right, so what will happen is, all right, our sodium three molecules, they enter into the pump, all right, ATP binds on to the ATP binding site. As the sodium enter in, the ATP, all right, it's broken down into ADP. That causes a configuration uh, change here to the pump, and the three sodium move out. All right, now the phosphate that got snapped off of our ATP stays here. That keeps the pump in this shape. And then the two sodium, excuse me, the two potassium that are outside the cell, they move in. And then as soon as that potassium, or excuse me, that phosphate molecule pops off, the pump goes back to its original shape. And sodium now is it moves across that plasma membrane and then it gets ejected into the internal uh, portion of the cell. All right, we'll go into much more detail about this. Just keep in mind that it does require um, ATP. And so one ATP, is going to get you two potassium molecules that move into the cell and three sodium molecules that move out of the cell. And both of those molecules are moving against their concentration gradient. Against their concentration gradient. Because there's way more sodium outside the cell, but this pump keeps adding to it. And there's way more potassium inside the cell but this pump keeps adding to that also. We'll learn about the importance of that concentration gradient later on. All right, uh, another type of active transport is what we call secondary active transport. Again, we're still gonna be moving substances up the concentration gradient, but remember what I said, when molecules are in motion, we're generating kinetic energy. So this type uh, of concept is really nice because as one substance is moving up its concentration gradient, it's generating um, energy from that. That allows another substance to move 
down its concentration gradient. Okay, so as one moves against its concentration gradient, the energy generated from that allows, all right, another substance to move down its concentration gradient. So we have two types, sim meaning the same. So simport means that both of those substances are gonna move in the same direction. Now keep in mind, one of those substances is moving up its concentration gradient. The other one's moving down. And then antiport means that the two substances are moving in opposite directions. Same concept though. All right. The other part of active transport involves vesicle transport. Remember those little packages that we were talking about? Well, we're going to now talk about this process here. And so it involves us talking about this wonderful, you're going to hear me talk about exocytosis so much. You heard me briefly talking about it at the beginning of this chapter when we were talking about the Golgi apparatus and the rough endoplasmic reticulum. All right, but now we'll go into a little bit more detail. So our Golgi apparatus just got done making its secretory vesicle and it's packaged up some really awesome proteins. It's got to get rid of those awesome proteins and it's got to get them out of the cell. So the secretory vesicle that gets generated and created from the Golgi apparatus migrates towards our plasma membrane here. And so it starts to fuse with the plasma membrane. And as it fuses with the plasma membrane, that secretory vesicle starts to open up, right? And we can start to see the external environment, external portion of the cell it starts to become available to it. Once it is opened up enough, then that secretory vesicle can expel or release the contents into the interstitial fluid. Sometimes we see, remember what I said, sometimes those secretory vesicles will incorporate whatever proteins are inside into the actual plasma membrane. So we have two possibilities. We're going to talk more about how it just releases the contents outside the cell because there's gonna be a lot of um, different types of processes that are involved with that. All right, so that's exocytosis. That is the cell getting rid of stuff that's inside. So what about if the cell wants to take in something from the outside? So we have a process called endocytosis. And this has to do with, all right, the cell's uptake of large substances that are sitting outside the cell. It's gonna be similar to exocytosis, but we're going in the opposite direction now. All right, so we have some material outside the cell. The cell's like, I could really use that. You know, I'm gonna uh, break it down maybe and make some uh, proteins because there's amino acids there or fats, lipids, whatever. All right, so what it'll do is it is going to then undergo three types of endocytosis to get that material. The three types are phagocytosis, and that should sound familiar because I talked about phagocytosis when I was talking about our macrophages, the Pac-Man cells. The macrophages go around, they gobble things up. Well, that's essentially what phagocytosis is. All right, there's pinocytosis, and then there's receptor-mediated endocytosis. Let's talk about the first one, phagocytosis, All right? Nickname cell eating. So we have a large particle that's sitting outside of our cell and the cell is gonna eat it. How does it do it? Part of the plasma membrane starts to kind of um, expand out and it creates these little pseudopods, like these little arm-like projections on either side of our particle that we wanna take in they eventually surround the particle and then they close it off into right, a sac made of the membrane. And it pulls that sac inside the cell. And what it'll do is it'll fuse it with the lysosome. Remember our lysosomes, those are digestive organelles. And it'll fuse it with the lysosome and then the enzymes inside the lysosome will start to go to work on whatever that large particle is. All right, so we'll see that quite a bit in our white blood cells because that's how they roll. 
Right? And that's how, what we're seeing here. So here you have our large particle. The cell wants it. It wraps around it, all right? Creates this vesicle here, all right? And then it has that large particle inside. It'll fuse that large particle with the lysosome. And that lysosome will digest whatever that large particle is. All right. Another type of endocytosis is penocytosis. This is cell drink drinking. All right, so if we have some liquid droplets outside of our cell in the interstitial fluid, all right, our cell that wants to take that in can do it, but now it can do it on a multiple level, all right, type of process in which is small, it forms a lot of these small little cell membrane sacs, these vesicles here. A lot of your cells can do this, all right? Problem is it's nonspecific. Okay, because that means, say, it just wants some sodium or it wants some calcium. Well, if there's potassium molecules there, some phosphate molecules that it doesn't necessarily need, it doesn't matter. It's, it, it, it can't be specific. It just takes whatever it can get. So here you can see all right, some of our molecules here, all right, these little liquid droplets outside the cell. The cell just pinches off around it. Same thing. Forms a vesicle, pulls it in. The last type of endocytosis is our receptor-mediated endocytosis. Now, this involves some of those receptors that sit on our plasma membrane. And it, what will happen is, all right, those receptors are specific to a specific type of what we call a ligand, which is a specific chemical. So those receptors will bind on to molecules that are out in the interstitial fluid and it pulls them in. And this helps to get in quite a lot of large quantity substances. For example, we'll see this and you get, you're very fortunate, I'm very, very envious of you folks because you don't get to do it this in this class, but when you get into metabolism uh, in, in 211, you're gonna talk about how we get, all right, cholesterol from outside of the cell, essentially from the blood, into a cell, into a liver cell. And so we'll see that this is how, all right, the cells of your body pull, all right, cholesterol out of your blood. And so you've heard of this term maybe before LDLs, which is considered the bad cholesterol. Right, but basically, it's, it's a protein with a lipid group attached to it. And so what we'll see is Cholesterol will bind on to all right, these low density lipoproteins, right, and they'll get kind of stuck onto the plasma membrane of the cell. And then what will happen is the cell will then fold in, like we saw before. All right, it will then internalize all those LDLs. I'll show you right here. So here you can see in our little diagram, you have these little receptors here, and they're specific for a certain type of molecule. Pretend this is this is cholesterol. So you have all these cholesterol receptors here. They're trying to grab onto the cholesterol that's floating around in the blood. And when you get enough of them, the cell will then fold in on itself, like you see here, and it will form all right this vesicle here. And it puts a special ID marker on the outside, and we call that clathrin. All right. So now we know, hey, this is a special type of vesicle that contains like our LDLs, our low density uh, lipoproteins in there, which is important for um, our fat metabolism. All right, that's it for the active processes. You probably were thinking he was never gonna finish with that. And then now we gotta return back to our cell again, because we just talked about all that goes on the plasma pro uh, membrane. Remember the three components of the cell? We were talking about it last class, right? You've got the cytoplasm. You also have the plasma membrane and the nucleus. So we have to, we talked about the other two, but now I'd like to talk about the nucleus. All right, the nucleus, when you're looking at a cell on a microscope is the easiest to identify, the largest structure on the internal portion of the cell, All right? We call it the control center because there's a lot of important um, material that is kept here in the nucleus. All right, mainly our DNA. And our DNA is our genetic makeup. All right, so pretty much all the cells in the body 
have a nucleus and pretty much all the cells in the body have one nucleus. But of course, there are exceptions to the rule. Erythrocytes, for example, all right, a mature red blood cell will not have a nuclei, all right? Whereas we learn in lab that a skeletal muscle cell can be multinucleated. A cardiac cell can also have up to two nuclei. So again, we'll see, but for the most part, most of the cells have one nucleus. And we learned when we were going over epithelial tissue, the shape of the nucleus will pretty much be similar or mirror the shape of the overall cell. So our nucleus is surrounded by this structure called the nuclear envelope, which is similar to the plasma membrane that surrounds the cell. Uh, it's also a phospholipid bilayer. Uh, and what we'll see is what it does is it helps to separate all right, the cytoplasm from the internal environment of the nucleus, which is also filled with a fluid called nucleoplasm. But there are holes in this nuclear envelope, and we call those nuclear pores. Right? And we also will note that the um, inside of the nucleus right, pretty much has a direct line to the rough endoplasmic reticulum. Because again, when we're dealing with the rough endoplasmic reticulum, we're dealing with protein synthesis, amongst other things also. All right? but we're going to be dealing with an, um, protein synthesis. So these nuclear pores are going to allow all right, proteins, like for example, the ribosomes, to leave the um, nucleus and go out into the cytoplasm and maybe float around as free ribosomes or attach onto uh, the endoplasmic reticulum and become uh, part of the rough endoplasmic reticulum. So again, these pores allow for things to leave the inside of the nucleus, but also they can allow things to enter into the nucleus, right? Because again, we will need to help create things, build things also inside the nucleus. Well, inside of our nucleus, we have another structure called the nucleolus, which is a, like another ball. It's like a ball within a ball. That's what the nucleus is. And so the ball that's within the ball is the nucleolus, right? it's pretty much going to contain proteins and our RNA. And this is where we make, I remember we were talking about the ribosomes and I drew this picture, you've got the small subunit here and then you've got the larger subunit below it, right? And then the protein gets fed through and we make the protein, okay? So not all the cells will have the nucleolus, but our nucleolus is where we make our large and small subunits for the ribosomes because our ribosomes are then going to make all right, our proteins. So here you can see our nice picture of our nucleus and inside you can see the nucleolus. Here's the nucleolus, all right? Here is the nucleus, this whole structure here. You can see the nuclear pores. We got some ribosomes sitting on the outside. All right, so it allows for structures through these nuclear pores to come in and out. And also we'll see that it allows for the, uh, um, a con we, allow we can see it's contiguous with our rough endoplasmic reticulum. And then all throughout here, you can see the chromatin, which is just coiled up chromosomes, your DNA. Just a quick review, again, when we're talking about our DNA, it's in the nucleus then, it is going to be made up of those repeating nucleotides, those monomers there, the deoxyribonucleotides, which will alternate, you know, they'll, they'll be attached to, all right, these other two structures, all right, not the other two structures, our nucleotides, all right, are gonna be made up of a phosphate group and a five carbon sugar group. Right. But then we'll see uh, all, not alternating with any, well, there is a specific type of pattern, right? But it, it will contain these nitrogenous bases that will make up that Crick's ladder there. So the pores are actually, okay, think of it like this. Remember how the plasma membrane 
is that phospholipid bilayer. All right. So think about uh, the, the nuclear pores, all right, like a hole in that phospholipid bilayer of the nuclear envelope. So if you were to see here, so you'll have these pores here that will allow the passage of things in and out of the, pla of the um, nuclear envelope. Things can go in and things can leave. And that's basically, so the pores are just gonna be like, if you were to punch a hole, all right, through your wall to look into the other room. That's what a pore is gonna be here. You got it. Okay, so basically what this slide is telling you, all right, is, and I'm not gonna get into the whole DNA, but how we hold these nucleotides together, all right, they're held together by a, by a phosphodiester bond. That's basically a bond between all right, two phosphate molecules. And of course, certain nucleotides are going to, um, excuse me, certain nitrogenous bases are going to be attached all right, to a specific nitrogenous base. And what will happen is it will create this structure, all right, this Crick-Watson model, it looks like a, a spiral ladder. So if you just take a ladder and twist it, all right, you'll see all right, that the actual rungs of the ladder, these are the struts, and then the rungs go from side to side. All right, so the rungs will be those nucleotide, those nitrogenous bases all right, that are going to be attached to each other, those, those pairs. And then the struts, which will be this portion of the ladder, is going to be made up of the sugar and phosphate groups. And so we connect them to one another through hydrogen bonds, which are effectively good bonds to have, okay? Relatively stable, good to have. But whole point is, this is where our genetic material is going to be. Now, notice it says it houses most of the genetic material for the cell. All right, not all of it because don't forget about the ribosomes, excuse me, not the ribosomes, the mitochondria. The mitochondria also have some DNA in them, all right? But keep in mind, all right, when we're talking about humans, we are going to have 46 double-stranded DNA molecules. 46, you need to know that number. So if you don't know a lot about genetics and whatnot, we have, all right, all of our genetic makeup for each cell are going to be found in each of the nuclei there. So that's a lot of information. It is tons of information. And I don't really have a cool fact to tell you if we were to straighten it all out, line it up end to end, that it could go around the world a billion times. I don't have anything on that. But what I do know is it's so much information that these cells had to get creative and they had to figure out a way to pack in all that DNA information into the cell. And they did. And they did it with these nuclear proteins called histones. And these guys look like a hockey puck. And so they've wrapped the gen genetic information around these histones. All right, and then what will happen is they'll coil themselves up. And so when they coil themselves up, we can pack all of that DNA chromatin, right, into these structures in which we call chromosomes. So uh, here's the picture. So when you break it down, all right, here's our DNA. And you can see it's just like taking a ladder and twisting it. All right, so you have the struts and you have the rungs here. So you can see here, all right, our rungs are going to be made up of, all right, the nitrogenous bases here, all right, guanine, cysteine, adenine, thymine, all those will be linked to one another through these hydrogen bonds, right? And the backbone are going to be the sugar and the phosphate molecules here. So again, that's a lot of material. It's a lot of information. So what we've done is, all right, yeah, it's helped that it's, it's, it's a spiral ladder here. But now what we're going to do is we're going to take that spiral ladder and we're going to wrap it around these structures called histones, all right? And we just keep wrapping it around and wrapping it around. And that's their job. That's these proteins, their job, all right? 
is to have the uh, genetic information wrap around it. And then as we start to take those histones and we start to coil them up and we coil them up into this structure called chromatin. And then that chromatin is just this coiled information that makes up our chromosomes. And all of this is floating around inside of your um, nucleus. And you have 46 of them floating around inside the nucleus. Well, more than just that. Okay, that's it for that. I'm not going to talk about that, but I want to talk about cell division real quick here. We're not going to go into cell division, but you need to know what it is. When a cell divides, you start with one cell, you wind up with two cells, and those two cells are called the daughter cells, right? So we're going to see cell division occur as we grow. So we need new growth, new tissues and whatnot. Um, if old cell gets damaged, all right, um, or if you just happen to skin your knee and we need to replace those cells, all right, we'll see the cell division occur. Now there's two types of cell division. We have mitosis and meiosis. Let's go with the easy one first. Meiosis is when our sex cells divide. What's that? Well, sex cells are sperm in men and eggs are oocytes in women. And then mitosis is all the other cells. Real simple. Let's keep it simple here. So think meiosis, involves cell division of our sex cells, sperm and oocytes. Mitosis is all the other cells in the body, which we call somatic cells. And it's that easy, that simple. So what is the function of nuclear pores? The function of the nuclear pores is to allow the movement of particles into and out of the nucleus. That's its job. Holy moly, I did not think that this would ever happen, that I would get done this soon. So, any questions? I can take questions, questions now, now, since we have a few minutes. minutes. Any, any questions? questions? 